I'm, I am going to break the rules a little bit. I do have some visuals that go along with this talk, but uh, and Shanali is going to flip my slides for me. So uh, I, I, Rackspace asked me to go study the future and go and uh, and all over the world. I was just in Toronto and St. John, mm -hmm. meeting with all sorts of people, seeing all sorts of cool stuff, um, and. Because I, I interview so many people, either in my studio in San Francisco or, um, or going around the world, I get to see patterns that other people don't get to see or get to see them earlier. The, the five patterns that I was seeing two years ago are, are patterns that other people saw. I, you know, we call uh, the, the, the first couple of forces the Internet of Things, right? The number of sensors on us and around us are going up exponentially. Now we're all carrying a mobile phone with seven sensors, and some of us have nine sensors on our, our smartphones. And that's going up exponentially with things like n the Nest thermostat that Google just bought for $3 billion. <laughs> it's a little bit expensive. Um, but it, uh, just yesterday in Toronto, I saw a whole bunch of sensors for weight lifters that are coming out, and all, all sorts of stuff that we can talk about. Go ahead, next. The second force I was seeing is uh, the amount of wearable computers is going up. You know, th there's quite a few people who have Fitbits or Jawbones or uh, Nike fuel bands or, you know, and then we saw the Google Glass was going to come out two years ago. Um, the guy on the left is uh, the founder of Recon Instruments and he makes little computers for ski goggles and, and wearable uh, glasses. The ski goggle, by the way, shows you <coughs> where you are in the mountain, uh, how fast you're going, where your kids are, which is really cool, uh, or your friends. Anybody who has not Android or an iPhone can, shows up in the glass. Um, what your hang time of your jump is, so that the fact that we're getting sensors now on our face and on our bodies means we can study all sorts of stuff. I, I don't jump when I ski, on purpose at least. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we, uh, the basis watch has a little a heartbeat sensor that watches your heart rate and your exercise. Uh, so it, 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 it's like a fuel ban on steroids. The Google Glass we can talk about. Um, uh, that should be coming out this year. And the thing on the right is uh, two kids out of Stanford put a high definition ca uh, video camera, so Jim Long probably would be interested in that, into a sunglass frame. So you can be walking around and it's very hard to see these cameras. And that brings up a new privacy thing, a problem that we'll talk about in a second. Next. <coughs> You add on, to, on all these cool new technologies onto the stuff that, um, the, the location that's going up exponentially. So Foursquare and Facebook check-ins and Waze and Google Maps, Apple Maps, Navtech, the amount of information about where we are is going up every day. And, and anytime you see an exponential number on something, that means new businesses are possible and our lives are changing just because of this force. Next. You add on social, right? <coughs> um, when I first got on Twitter um, in 2006, there was only 70,000 total tweets, and that was in the first six months, you know, or first five months of the service. Today, there's 500 million or half a billion tweets a day, and it's going up exponentially, and there's entire businesses that are built on top of just Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you see the numbers are going up exponentially on Snapchat and on, on all sorts of systems, Quora and Google Plus. Um, and that means that the world is changing and the kinds of things that we can do are changing. That, you know, we wrote a book about this force eight years ago called Naked Conversations and it, it's really uh, continuing to be an important force. And then you add on, I, I just kept seeing new data, inclu including this month, I've seen two new databases in the past month that are coming out because the data center itself is changing from hard drive media where you have to, your, your uh, database technology like Oracle had to be written to wait for that disk to spin so that information could be sucked off the disk and put onto your browser, onto your computer. Now we have our data centers are changing to SSD, so there's new in-memory databases that are radically faster than just a couple years ago. And there's new kinds of databases, like there's graph databases that are not relational, or there's NoSQL databases that are really uh, designed for this new streaming world. You know, Union Pacific is putting sensors underneath all the rails in, uh, across America. They're hitting 40 million sensor readings a day and those sensors can tell um, as the train goes overhead uh, 
whether the, the cars need maintenance or not. And, and uh, including, there's all sorts of companies that are coming out that deal with the Twitter fire hose. So Datasift is one of those. And on and on, there's just a ton of innovation. We call this big data, right? So th these five trends are all worthy of a book on its, its own, and uh, it's worthy of discussion, just you know, each one of these forces. But two years ago, go ahead. Two years ago, uh, I started noticing in, in discussions with uh, R&D people that these five forces are being fused together to make something different happen. And I call it contextual systems or contextual operating systems. Google in the next 18 months is gonna have a, a contextual operating system. Um, and we're starting to see early, early versions of this on our iPhones. How many people have Moves, for instance? Does anybody have the Moves app? Yeah. So the Moves app, I'll show it to you offline because it's hard to show here. The Moves app is watching the sensors on my iPhone and knows whether I'm walking, running, driving, or biking. So it knows four contexts about me just based on the sensors, right? Just on the sensor pattern. And they, they have 51, sensor, uh, 51 contexts that you can manually tell it. So if you're skiing and it doesn't recognize that, and, but it does recognize you're going up and down a ski slope, well, you mark it as skiing, and it's starting to learn those patterns, those sensor patterns, so in a year, it's gonna automatically know that you're skiing. Or if you're shopping, and you're on uh, Georgetown uh, University in, in Georgetown, um, you can mark that, that I'm on a shopping tour, and it's gonna try to uh, use that sensor pattern to figure out what you're trying to do. Um, Google is uh, already showing a little way, and let's, let's go into these. Well, let's talk about Google in a second. It, for, for humans, it means two things, this new system, this new uh, capability. Uh, by the way, the sensors are, are really, uh, I don't even understand how, how useful the sensors are. There's a company uh, that's making a, a software wrapper for the motion sensor that's in the iPhone and it can tell that your phone is sitting on a desk within a second of you putting it on a desk. And it can tell based on the vibration of you holding it that you're holding the phone. And it's, it changes and says you're holding the phone. And it can tell that it's in your pocket and it can tell that. And it can tell if I walk around that I'm in a walking mode and it switches into walking, right? So the sensors really give a lot of information to the operating system and this is information that a laptop just doesn't have because a laptop wasn't designed to be carried in our pocket or in our hand or on our body like these new wearable computers. So uh, for humans, this new contextual world means two things. One, our products are gonna be highly personalized in the future. You know, the Oakley Airwave goggle, when you put it on, has my uh, skiing data and has my family hooked up to it. And in the future, I, we went and visited Oakley, they said, you know, the, the product itself is gonna change because of the sensors on it. Uh, they can, in the future, they're thinking about how to, how to change the, the color of the, of the glass based on, your, uh, on, on, your, on what you're doing, you know? Um, and uh, Scully Helmets um, is putting a little wearable computer in the helmet and has a camera in the back. So you might say, well, that's not as safe as, uh, you know, as before, but it's actually safer because now the motorcycle uh, rider can actually see 360 degrees around him and see information about what's coming up in the road ahead. If you use Waze, for instance, you know um, that you, everybody's reporting objects in the road and, and, and uh, traffic conditions, so you really have a lot more information about the activity that you're going on, and it's very, very personalized to you. The thing in the middle is called Tap and Go, so if you're a college kid, this, this is a brand new company. Um, by the way, this company came, uh, was started by an ex-surveillance officer from the Israeli military. And you know, if you study surveillance, like at the NSA, what are they looking for? They're looking for terrorists or, or bad actors. Well, they're looking at your pattern because they know everybody has a common pattern. We go to the same place to work every day. We, work, we live in the same place. We go to the same 15 restaurants generally. Uh, if you go to church, you're we know where you're gonna be on Sunday morning, right? You have a common pattern through life and the surveillance officers are looking for when you break that pattern. 
uh, for when you do something extraordinary, like go and pick up a ton of fertilizer and uh, you know, 500 gallons of diesel fuel, right? It, if you're a farmer, that's in your normal pattern. So you won't get bothered. Um, but if you're somebody like me and I do that, I'm gonna get a little visit. <laughs> So he flips it around and he says, I don't care that you go out of, out of your pattern. What I'm looking for is when you are in your pattern. So the college kids pay for everything with tap and go. This is a new thing that just came out, just got funded from Vindo Kosla for $5 million. And you, so you buy your coffee on it, you buy your books on it, you buy your sandwich on it, you, you, you pay for your laundry on it. Uh, everything you do is on it. And, and so, um, and we'll talk about the, the pieces of this business because it's really a pretty interesting business. But if you buy a nice latte every morning at 9 a.m. On, on the way to your classes from the local coffee shop, it starts noticing that. And it starts saying, hey, would you like your normal iced latte when you leave your dorm room? Because the dorm room has a geofence around it, so you leave your dorm room and it starts asking, hey, are you on your way to history class like normal? We know you're on your way to history class because it's 9 a.m. on Monday morning, right? Would you like your normal ice latte? Ah, sure. And by the time you get there, the ice latte is made, it's waiting for you, and you just go in and pick it up. You don't even need to talk to anybody, and you don't need to hand over a credit card or cash. It charges you automatically, because it knows you're there in the restaurant, right? And we'll talk about how it knows. Um, the back end of this um, is a box that goes into the coffee shop. It, when you send an order in, it lights up, it beeps, and it prints out a, uh, a sticker, a receipt, that goes into the normal workflow of the sandwich shop or the coffee shop. And it's pretty remarkable. Next. So the second thing <coughs> that this contextual world is going to mean for humans, for us, is we're getting new kinds of anticipatory services and products. And we're, this is just at the beginning. You know, how many people have used Google Now, for instance? Yeah, that's starting to get really interesting. It, it listed out all my whole day today when I got, woke up and, told, and it's telling me how, you know, when to leave the hotel to get here on time, all sorts of fun stuff. It's trying to anticipate what I'm needing next based on my calendar, my email, my sensor readings. It, you know, I was standing next to a TV giving a speech one time and it asked to, if I wanted to take control of the TV and, and do stuff with the TV because the TV is an internet of things TV, it, it has a DLNA protocol on it, and it was sharing with the internet its behaviors. And Google's, Google Now was trying to take control of that. So Google really wants to get in here, don't they? Oh, they really well, they're an intent satisfaction company, and they want to study anytime you have intent. And taking control of a TV might be intent, right? I want to put a slide up there, that's intent, right? I want to change the heat in my house, that's intent. <laughs> and they really do want to, uh, yeah. They, it, get we, out of my head, Google. Well, uh, let's talk about that in the, in the, in, at the end. So next. The second, th it, so on business, th this has two impacts that I'm noticing. Uh, you're going to, as a business, you're going to be asked to see everything about everything. And think about Uber. Uh, Uber, it, when I want to ride around town now, I just say I need a ride and I can see the driver coming toward me, and the driver can see me, and I'm getting reviewed, the driver's getting reviewed in real time. This has deep implications on corporations, right? At Rackspace, I'm re reviewed every six months, so if I screw up today, it won't, you know, it, it won't show up in my review for six months, right? An Uber driver's reviewed every single ride, and if, you, if, if he gets too many one-star reviews, he gets washed out of the system. By the way, you as a customer is being reviewed as well. And that's, uh, we can talk about the reviewing system and, and how deeply it affects book sales and other things. But if you barf in a, in a cab at South by Southwest because you drank too much Jim Long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we'll get, we'll get a one star, right? And we might not get picked up. And uh, not getting picked up in DC on a cold morning is a little sucky, right? <laughs> Um, I just had, I had dinner with the uh, CEO of Irving Oil up in uh, Canada. It has one of the largest refineries in the world and, and has 900 retail establishments you know, that sell gas. And he, he was like, what do you mean by everything about everything? I said, do you know the wait time of drivers in, in your gas stations? No, you don't yet know everything about everything. And you will know everything about everything because you're going to put a 3D sensor there and watch it 
we'll talk about that. GE is putting sensors into jet engines and turbines and wingtips even to understand the, the plane and understand when it needs maintenance and, and be able to change the behavior of the engines. Um, you're going to know everything about everything. We can talk about the impact on that all day long. Uh, next. And the second thing it means for, for businesses is we're going to need to know a lot more about our customers than we do today. You know, I live right by the Ritz-Carlton in Half Moon Bay. Um, and, the, <coughs> you know, they really don't know me anymore <laughs> as a customer. Um, uh, when I'm there, it, well, they have four computer systems that run the Ritz, right? They have an open table computer that runs the main restaurant. They have a spa finder computer that runs the spa. They have a, a cheap iPad that, that runs the cheap restaurant, which isn't cheap. Um, <laughs> it's $19 for a hamburger, so <laughs> it's not cheap. <laughs> and um, uh, they have an IBM computer that runs the hotel. These computers are not talking to each other very well. And uh, you can tell that they don't talk to each other very well because when you tweet, you know, when you're sitting out there and drinking uh, on the back deck, you know, and you tweet, I'm having a great time in the Ritz, the social media listening team gets back to you. Well, great, this is an improvement over eight years ago when we wrote our book. At least there's a team, you know, watching their brand and making sure that everybody's sort of happy. But if you start having this conversation with the team, it's, it, they quickly turn tone deaf. Uh, they don't know who I'm sitting with. They don't know my lifetime value as a customer. They don't know what I'm eating or drinking. They don't know where on the property I'm sitting. And so they can't really serve me very well. And I, I, I uh, had dinner with the executive team at the Ritz, and we talked about this. And he goes, you know, the reason the Ritz has this high uh, customer service brand in all of our heads is 100 years ago when the Ritz started up, they had a room in the middle of the Ritz which had index cards on all of us. And they surveilled the hell out of us. They went through your trash and looked for candy wrappers when you stayed at the Ritz, right? And so they would have your favorite candy bar sitting on the pillow the next time you come back, right? That, that made you think, man, this, this, this hotel has their shit together, <laughs> you know? And they would uh, watch and see how many kids you have and did, it, did anybody in the family have allergies so that they would serve you different? And do you have a favorite activity? Do, do your kids like to swim? They would write all this stuff down on the index card so they would have a profile on you. This was 100 years ago, right? Before. Oh, that's the origin of the, you know, that, that phrase, putting on the ring. You know, but they, they told me that they used to be really surveillance oriented. They called it attentive. <laughs> you know, watch Jim Long and serve him, you know, and make sure he has a good time here and make sure his steak is done the way he likes it every single time. And if, if it, you know, if you do that, you're, you're like, this brand is taking care of me. Isn't right? so much of that, though, now just putting out fires? A lot of, a lot of that stuff is. Oh, there's somebody yelling on Twitter. Not I've yelled on Twitter. Right now. Yeah, but I think in the next five years it's going to radically change. And let's talk about how it's going to change next. So uh, we call this pinpoint marketing. Uh, you know, uh, the advertising industry is not yet there, but we're, there's technologies coming that are radically changing what's possible. So the thing on the left is uh, a 3D sensor. Uh, from Prime Sense, Apple just bought Prime Sense. It's an Israeli company, and they just bought it for a billion dollars. The guy who developed this sensor, you'll see a picture of him later in the discussion. Um, the, uh, the yeah, the, the guy who does, developed this technology licensed some of the technology to Microsoft for the Xbox Kinect sensor. So the new Xbox One is the 3D sensor, and that is so sensitive it can see your heart beat from across the room because you're skin is changing in color every heartbeat. And it can see that. I can't visually see that, but the sensor can actually see uh, your blood, your skin color change as your heart is beating, right? So this stuff is really pretty freaky and really pretty crazy. This sensor is so sensitive that I, I, I got a demo of it, and um, they had it uh, aimed at a desk, nothing on the desk, and a projector on the desk. And it was so sensitive it could tell how hard I was touching the desk. And I, it was letting me do pressure sensitive writing on the desk without a sensor on the desk. Um, some things about these sensors, uh, the price is radically coming down. Last year at CES, this sensor was $100. This year it's $20. And just yesterday, I saw a cheap version that cost 50 cents. 
So uh, the, the ability to do 3D sensing of gestures and looking at your face and your hands and doing some radical stuff is pretty crazy. So this, this picture is uh, a company called Shopperception that's using this sensor uh, to watch you in a grocery store. And this guy, this is so sensitive and so accurate that it can see your hand heading toward a box of Cheerios in a grocery store. And it can see that you grab the box of Cheerios and put it in a shopping cart. So, um, you know, uh, this is actually being tested in Walmart, mostly for shopping analytics, so they can st study uh, flow time and dwell time in front of a, uh, you know, in front of the cereal aisle, so they can understand what you're looking at, what you're touching, what what you're doing. But you take this a little bit further, and it's really going to build a, a new kind of smart grocery store. And it's just one piece of a smart grocery store. The second piece is this thing called Shelf Bucks, which is in the middle. It, they won the Demo God a year, Demo God at Demo last year. Um, it has nine radios in it, and uh, they're going to put 50 of these in a grocery store. Uh, so you're going to walk into the cookie aisle, and there's going to be a Shelf Bucks display, and you're going to load a Shelf Bucks app on your phone, and you're going to tap your phone onto that display, and it's going to tell you stuff about the about what you're looking at. It's going to give you loyalty points for doing that, right? Uh, which I'm already getting loyalty points for buying, for, for using my Safeway card, right? And, and the Irving Oil guy, he says, man, I, I'm expanding my loyalty program to have thousands of, of places that you're gonna use your, my loyalty program around town to study you uh, in a deep way and serve you better and give you uh, dollars off and you know, free prizes and all sorts of stuff. And, and the loyalty program at Safeway gives me, you know, two dollars off some meat or five dollars off a bottle of wine. And of course, I'm going to use it, right? This thing. So this thing um, is going to know that I'm in the cookie aisle, and is going to be able to interact with me and serve me in a new way that we we still are trying to conceive of. The retailers are having lots of fun at their conferences talking about what to do what to do with this kind of technology. Inside, there's nine radios. Um, and uh, they're using a thing called uh, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy is the best radio, uh, which works with all the iPhones. We'll talk about that and, and, and Samsung's. All the high-end phones have that. Um, but if you walk in with a crappy old phone, they sti it still can work with that because they, they have these nine radios. If you have a new phone, uh, it'll actually know where you're standing and where you're traveling between these, these 50 radios that are going to be in a grocery <coughs> store. So they're going to be able to tell what aisle you walk down to get to the milk, which, uh, you know, I used to run a retail store and I'd, I'd watch that manually and try to figure out, okay, everybody's going for, in my case, they were going for the film in the back, you know, because everybody needed film for the camera. So I was designing my store to put things in, in their way to increase sales. And you know, if you go into a fries, that's exactly what they're doing. They're, they're putting the loss leaders in the back of the store and they're trying to figure out how to increase their purchase per customer by putting things in, in your way on the way back to the, uh, to the loss leaders. Um, the thing on the right is uh, Vintank, and that's a company in Napa that studies any time you say something about wine on social media. So if you say, uh, if we, you know, Jim Long and I are going to dinner tonight, and uh, if we say uh, we're having a great bottle of Cabernet, right, um, it'll, we're being tracked and we're being put in a database and a profile is being built on both of us, right? Um, he is seeing already 1.1 million tweets a day about wine. About, so all of us are sharing 1.1 million tweets a day and it's an exponential number, it's going up. No, uh, no, this is uh, another guy. But uh, Gary Vee is, very, is, is using this, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> uh, he wants to know. He, he's doing a lot of database st stuff. He, he built it. Gary Vee is a, a wine seller in New York that has a famous wine show and is a big social media guy. Um, he, he built a database of everybody who's tweeted about Gary Vee. So, because <laughs> he wants to understand, you know, is there a pattern and, and is there a new way to interact with my customers and my, my fan base, right? And uh, he's a smart guy. Um, so this thing is already seeing you tweet about wine. They're now putting geofences around all the wine stores <laughs> and all the wineries. 
So if I own, let's say I own a Paradox Winery in Napa, and let's say you own Camus Winery. Now Camus, if you know anything about wine, Camus is like $200 a bottle of wine, you know, 80 to $300. And let's say you own Sutter Home. Sutter Home is a $10 a bottle of wine. And let's say you come to Napa. Well, I'm, and, and you end up in my store, but you first you go to Camus, I know that you, that you like $400 bottles of wine. So I can take you straight to my reserve room and, and treat you differently than if you go to Sutter Home and you're a $10 bottle of wine guy, right? The context of where we've been and what we've done and who we're with is going to change what you get. And this is already true at some crude levels. You know, I, 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 if you go to the wineries and you know, you see the uh, the famous people. They get a dinner with the CEO. I've, I've been at some of those dinners. And I had dinner with the vice president, and the actor had a dinner with the CEO, <laughs> and was getting served in a different way than I was getting served. And this is part of life. But this is going to be automatic now. It's going to be built into our into our world. And Amazon and uh, all sorts of companies are treating you differently based on who you are. Yeah. This is really interesting, this side of it, but then I think it brings up a lot of the issues about the control of the data. Yeah. Uh, like Sandy Pentland and other, at the Media Lab, how they focus on how you control the data. Because you take the example earlier of a grocery store yeah. where it's sort of like extortion, really. Because sometimes you'll see the regular value without the card yeah. is like $7. With the card, it's three twenty-five. Yeah. The information I'm giving them is not worth $4. Uh. I mean... It well, is, well, actually. I, it is. <laughs> it, in aggregate, it is. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, yeah. It's, it's really a matter of, if, if you have these loyalty programs, right, where, yeah. where he wants to learn more about you, how, do you, how can you feel like you actually are getting value out of it? Yeah. Instead of them just saying, hey, we're going to charge more to people who don't that, That's actually a, a, an interesting question. You know, uh, Gary Vee and I have given talks, and I, I, you know, when we do the, the talks together, I focus more on the technology, on the, on the radios, and we're going to talk about that in a second. And then he says, uh, okay, you can build a database now <laughs> that does all the sort of, sorts of fun stuff. What, you're going to need emotional intelligence to convert the technology into something that's not freaky and has value and has utility to customers. And uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Let's come back to that because I have a, a slide on privacy and, and utility in, the, in a second. Next. So let's talk about how some of this stuff works. Uh, this is the uh, new smart Bluetooth or low energy Bluetooth uh, beacons. Uh, the press is largely calling it iBeacons, but iBeacon is the Apple protocol on top of the radio. So when you say iBeacon, you're talking about the Apple software for the iPhone. Um, it's, it's more generic as uh, Bluetooth low energy or BLE uh, beacons. These beacons uh, cost about $10 wholesale. The guy on the right is the CEO of Broadcom, and he's making them, uh, um, among others. The one in the middle is Estimotes, and they're $30 retail. Uh, these things uh, 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 last for two years on a little coin battery. There could be one underneath your seat right now, and you would never see it there, right? But what it does is spray a number into the air every second. And my iPhone or my Samsung phone can tell how close it is to that beacon. And so as I walk closer to it, the system can change what's on your iPhone. So if you're uh, building a, a museum, you're going to put one of these underneath each picture. And as I walk around, it's going to change to tell me detail about what I'm standing in front of right there. So uh, payments are changing because of these. If you walk into an Apple store right now, uh, the Apple app, changes as you walk around the store because there's a couple beacons. Um, baseball stadiums uh, this year are going to have 65 of these uh, uh, before the first opening game. Apple's putting them in all the baseball stadiums with uh, Major League Baseball. So uh, how many people have one of these? Yesterday I asked this question and I, uh, one guy had one. What? One of these beacons. BLE beacons. Yeah. How many people have an iPhone with iOS 7? You all have one, and you don't even know it. <clears throat> now, it's not turned on yet, because the software literally came out this week for this, to turn on this new capability. But if I put a new Facebook or a new Twitter app, and I turn on that beacon, now I can have a new social network. I can build an automatic hashtag just because my iPhone is gathering the data from all of you, and it can build a new kind of social network. Um, 
we're going to see th hundreds of thousands of these in the world. So as we walk through the world, they're, they're uh, going to change payments and they're going to change customer experiences. Let's go next. So when you add all this stuff up that's happening, it, our products are radically changing. The uh, Chevy Volt that my friend has uh, creates 200 megabytes, 200 megabytes per second of data. Uh, a lot of that's thrown away, but the car itself is changing. It's now an API. How many people uh, know what Tesla studies about you? No. Yeah. How many people saw the New York Times versus Tesla articles? because uh, New York Times wrote a bad review about Tesla. Uh, they, the reviewer was trying to go, I think, from New York to Boston, and, may, and the car ran out of energy, and he had a picture of the car being towed away because he was stuck in the middle of nowhere. And Elon Musk wrote an article saying, this guy wanted, made the car fail by his behaviors and had pictures of the car doing donuts in a parking lot. And New York Times, had to pull, had to apologize for that reviewer's review and said the reviewer was not accurate about what he was doing and what he was turning on in the car and trying to, to do. He was not. So the car itself is surveilling the hell out of you now. Mercedes just announced a contextual car at Consumer Electronics Show. Uh, Tesla is full on studying you fully, like where you are. What, what you're doing on the pedals, what you're doing with the uh, air conditioner, what you're doing with the moonroof, all of that is being tracked and put up in the cloud uh, so that uh, their, their engineers can do stuff with that. And it, it's radically changing what cars are doing. A friend of mine wrote a, a, a Google Glass app for his dad's Tesla, and he can see how much energy is in the Tesla, where the Tesla is parked. Uh, he can say, OK, Glass, uh, open moonroof, and the moonroof opens. The car itself is uh, API now. And in fact, there's little boxes that you can buy for your existing car called, from a company called Automatic that go underneath your dash and turn your car into an API where you can have an iPhone app or an Android app that lets you see the, see the, uh, yeah, lets you see the, uh, uh, the car in a new way. Yeah? You gotta move to Q&A. Okay, so uh, just let me go. <laughs> next, next. We gotta set the tone here because this is gonna be interesting. Context is changing health. There's going to be sensors on you. Uh, over on the picture on the right is an old needle. And you see the little bumps? Those are new silicon needles. They're going to sit on your skin. I, I tried them. It feels like putting your finger on a piece of sandpaper. And it takes a few cells of blood out of your skin and does stuff with that, puts medicine in it. There's pills that we're going to eat that are going to study our innards in all sorts of ways. The pill, there's a picture of the pill that I saw. And Google's developing pills. Next. It means cities are changing. We, we are now, you know, when my, when my dad, uh, when I was growing up, nobody wanted to live in downtown. And downtown is where the high crime was. Uh, there was a lot of decay. Uh, it was where the poor people lived. But now the kids want to live in downtown because they can get services, not just Uber. Uber does not come to my house in Half Moon Bay. It does come to my studio in San Francisco, right? Instacart delivers groceries to my studio or my phone in San Francisco. eBay now will bring a, an Apple power supply if I lose one right to me, but not at my house in, in the rural area, right? So now there's a, a reverse flow. It's more interesting to live downtown because you get served better and your government even serves you better. You can report potholes and, and tell the mayor all sorts of stuff right back from your cell phone. Next. So that leads into the discussion. <laughs> which usually happens, which is, if this stuff doesn't freak you out at some level, it probably should. Um, and we have uh, new privacy problems. Everybody keys in on the Google Glass about the camera. That's not the privacy problem. Privacy problem is this has an eye sensor on it. It's watching me. It's watching me. When you get pulled over by a cop, what do they do? They ask you, follow my finger. This is going to know that I'm drunk or sober at some level. It, it certainly will in the future. And the sensor platform that it, it represents, it's the first consumer electronics gadget that knows where I'm aimed and where my eyes are looking. Two, two new inputs. And there's a lot more coming. I, yesterday, I wore a brain sensor. And as I had thoughts, stuff happened on the screens. 
It was mind-blowing. And this is going to be built into our products in the future. You know, it is, Google is going to go into your head. And it's not just Google. The system. <laughs> you know, when you watch uh, uh, TV shows, it's the system. <laughs> we have a machine, and it's watching it. Well, it, I was wearing a galvanic skin response sensor at uh, NextWeb last year. And uh, the guy who invented it was watching my nervous system in real time on his iPhone. And he held it up, and he said, oh, you were really nervous, and now you're pretty calm. Um, and we had started having a, this was in Amsterdam, so we started having a conversation. And um, I, I, we started talking about the red light district in Amsterdam, and it spiked up. I was like, this is a new privacy problem that I didn't think about. <laughs> yeah, and with these three, this is the guy who developed the 3D sensor, by the way. And, and uh, these sensors now are getting smaller and smaller and smaller every year and cheaper and cheaper. There's toys now. Uh, Wowie, uh, the, 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 the guy I saw uh, this week in, Mo in Toronto, uh, developed a 50 cent 3D sensor for the Wowie robot and it follows your hands and, and sees your gestures to the, to the device. Pretty mind-blowing stuff. 